before we continue with John Paul, as we're approaching the tipping point of his story, where things are going to steadily more move towards the transition to, to Night's End, let's check back in with Robin as he runs into the Huntress. Huntress. And we'll be showcasing, well, Showcase 94, issues 5 and 6, with Robin number 6 in between. Well, segments of Showcase 94. Showcase showcase series from DC during this period of time was a anthology book with a collection of short stories, some of which were like a big ongoing and continuity with each other. But rather than having like four or five, like short mini series, they put it into a bunch of smaller chapters, which were collected in the, in these showcase collections. Now these stories for these issues were written by Chuck Dixon with pencils by Phil Jimenez and inks by Bruce Patterson, but, Patterson, Romeo Tangal, and Peter Gross, with colors by Tom McGraw, lettering by Ken Brusniak, and edited by the legendary Denny O'Neill, along with Jordan B. Gorfinkel and Neil Posner. We open with internal narration on the current ongoing bloodbath within Gotham's underworld following Bane's rise and fall, as Asbat takes down a mob boss who is suspected to be next in line for the top spot. However, our internal narration isn't from Jean-Paul, it's from Helena Bertinelli, the post-crisis on Infinite Earth's Huntress. Helena is a mafia orphan, and she has a line on the Dark Horse candidate, Mandy, Mandy DiPaolo, who she knew when they both were kids. And by knew, I mean they hated each other, with Mandy trying to ruin Helena's confirmation party by throwing what looks like pie on her white dress. We get an interlude with Mandy, where we get confirmation that she's aiming for the top spot and is whacking anybody who gets in her way. As she goes to gloat about the murders to her priest brother and establish the alibi in the process, under the cover of the Sacrament of Confession, Helena attempts to thwart an attempted hit on a stolen car and money laundering operation and ends up getting surprised back up from Robin. In Robin's book, we pick up where Showcase 94, number 5, picked off, left off with the hit squad knocked out, their target alive and bailing, and Huntress getting smacked around a bit and being about to fall unconscious. Tim gets her to his car, the Red Bird, before she passes out and gets her home. Apparently, he knows her address. I don't know if this is from a previous crossover I haven't read yet or what. At the church, Mandy's brother confronts her. This isn't or wasn't a sincere confession. She was just here to establish an alibi. Later, he's visited by a man in priest vestments and a gold mask, asking for the guns that Mandy's brother was holding for him. Nice little bit of foreshadowing for the sequence with Death Angel never, who is this figure, never changing his pose here in any of the panels. In Mickey Silver's office, the guy who rents the car lot who was nearly whacked earlier, Huntress and Robin interrogate him about who was gunning for him, with Silver letting slip by implication that Mandy was behind the attempted hit. At Mandy's, she makes it clear to her subordinates that she is not happy with how things went down with Silver, while Robin and Huntress eavesdrop by a nearby rooftop. The meeting is interrupted by the gold-masked figure, again, Death's Angel, we don't know that name yet, but it will be established shortly, who bursts in and starts gunning Manny's lieutenants down. Huntress and Robin interrupt, driving the man, who we now formally get his name as Death Angel, off. Huntress warms Mandy off from her current course before they depart. Later, Mandy pays her brother another visit to make a donation and... Once again, it's implied to establish an alibi while Silver is gunned down at his office. At home, Helena goes through some old papers from school on a hunch and finds a drawing of the Death Angel costume. Props to him and is here, by the way, for doing some convincing, pretty good bad art in the sense that it feels like something someone would doodle in high school without being like too overly crude or, for that matter, um, a bit too polished. Meanwhile, Robin checks out the church that Mandy set up as her alibi and meets again with the nun from Firefly's Orphanage who reveals that the priest, Daniel, is Mandy's brother before pulling another vanishing act. I may just keep reading this Robin run on my own after the storyline to find out if this nun becomes a thing or not. In any case, Robin investigates Danny's office and finds the bulletproof vest that Death's Angel was wearing earlier only to be surprised by Death's Angel himself. Is this the end of Riders in the Sky? Wrapping things up in Showcase 94, Robin tries to talk down Death's Angel, and when that doesn't work, he's saved by interrupting Huntress. 
After the fight, Robin mentions that he was following up on Mandy's alibi and asks why Death's Angel was there. Hutchins explains that Danny had created the character for a comic he made while he was in school. Danny gave her a copy, and she'd hung on to it over all these years. I'm just going to say here right now, you don't hang on to something like that for over 10 years without some form of emotional connection. In any case, Robin and Huntress question one of the now-departed Mickey Silver's bodyguards, and they find out what Mandy really wants. The garbage racket, in the sense of the garbage hauling racket. And all the city contracts and all the ways you can launder money based on that and that sort of thing. Now, at the, well, Gotham dump, with some skillful dump bulldozer driving by Huntress, Huntress and Robin stop Mandy from whacking two more bosses and move to take her down, with Mandy perforating one of her own goons in the process. Ultimately, Daddy confronts Mandy, but can't bring himself to shoot his sister. Unfortunately for him, Mandy has no such objections. Robin talks Huntress down from killing the fat fratricidal sister, after which Mandy gloats that no jury would believe her capable of murder, never mind taking over the city's mob because of her gender. My brother, I just saved your life. Do me a favor and don't insult my intelligence. Save the tears for the jury. I'll do that. You don't think anyone's going to believe a woman was behind an attempted takeover of Gotham's mobs. Maybe you'll slide this time. And no one saw me shoot Danny. And even if you did, you'd never risk taking off that mask to testify. You've got all the answers, but think about this. Have you ever looked up and seen the bat signal in the sky over the city? Well, one of these nights, it'll be shining for you. I am slightly surprised that Arabin also doesn't respond with a, Bandy, you live in Gotham. Like, a directly that alluding and beyond just alluding to Batman, but also that Pamela Isley is an urban legend. Neither is Selena Kyle. You have a history of various women who have been heavily involved with crime. And in some cases, significant attempts at mass murder and terrorism to the point where you'd probably have to find a venue outside of Gotham to find a jury who will pro secure prosecutor wouldn't have a hard time or would have a hard time rather convincing that a woman would be capable of mass homicide. That said, I do appreciate Robin's little spin on ask not for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee in conjunction with the bat signal. This was an interesting little story, nothing grand, but it fits with, well, the street level Gotham stuff, um, which is what you expect from a bat family book. And without being overblown necessarily um, by major costume villains or that sort of thing. I appreciate Robin at this point in his solo career focusing on, well, the Gotham organized crime thing. I Partially because I like having that there is, can we continue the idea of there being a Gotham organized crime, Gotham mob, that it's not just costume criminals like the Joker and Two-Face and that sort of thing, that you have these more conventional hoods working in the background as well, and that they're kind of an ever-present thing with the bigger, -er, flashier goons or guys like, well, we have Joker and Scarecrow stealing the spotlight and drawing the Batman's attention to them because they're a more pressing concern. And having the Huntress be involved, Helena Bertinelli, fits in with this nicely because of her background as having been from a mob family. So all of that works well. There were some earlier Huntress stories, just doing some back checking before I did um, wrote the script for this episode, which did involve Huntress. She had a sh brief show, solo series, uh, Post Crisis on Infinite Earths. Um, she had a crossover with Robin in a three-issue miniseries, nothing to speak of, like uh, in, a, in a miniseries, Robin 3, before Robin's proper solo book started. But uh, it's interesting having them, um, but like it's interesting to have her work together here on this. It is a bit of, total whiplash is the wrong term, but uh, a misfit having Mandy not aware of, you know, in, 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 in a narrative sense, where she lives and works in terms of her 
defense, like, oh, they won't convict me because I'm a woman. Like, again, as I stated, she lives in Gotham. Even if you operate from the perspective that Denny O'Neill was trying to go with at the time of Batman as an urban legend, you still have the problem of, well, Batman may be a urban legend, Poison Ivy's not. We saw her attack a big gala during um, night during nightfall. Catwoman is not. She has a long established rap sheet. She, as we've seen her interacting with the GCPD and other groups in the course of her book, um, as part as that's intermingled with with the um, Night Quest, the Crusade storyline. So, presumably, Gotham City jurors are aware fully that women can be criminals, and as demonstrated by Pamela Isley, they could be criminals who will kill. So, Mandy doing a boo-hoo, poor little me approach, like, Part of this will work in terms of nobody saw me kill her brother. Or she could even say, I did it in self-defense. But the way it's presented here is bad. And that's that's strictly that's strictly on Chuck Dixon there. Otherwise, like this is a fun little story. Um I do intend at some point on my own time to continue reading this uh, run of Robin because I am interested to see if this mysterious nun continues popping up or if she just kind of gets forgotten about as a dropped plot thread. Next time, though, we're going to catch back up and see what Bruce Wayne has been up to as we return to the search. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any f future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.